into the uh, training center. That means middle school, where I'm from, we call it junior high. Uh, high school students are making their way to the student center. Y'all ready to get into the word tonight? Yeah. Hallelujah. Lift your Bibles high. We're going to get right into the word tonight. Yeah. Look at your neighbor say, I'm expecting. Uh, so say it again. Say, I'm expecting. S say it like you ain't going to have another repeat of 2014. So, 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 say it like you ain't going to never have a day of lack in your life again. Say it like you're going to make the devil pay for everything that he's ever tried. Now, I'm going to give you one more chance. T touch your neighbor say, I'm expecting. I'm expecting. Hallelujah. Lift your Bible. Let's make our confession of faith together. I am unconditionally loved by God and at harvest. I come to him just as I am, but I won't stay as I am because the message I'm prepared to receive will make me more like the great I am. I am blessed and I am favored in Jesus' name. Remain standing. I want to go to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. We are uh, in our series, Teth, but as we are setting the stage for our conference, which will begin one week from today. It looks at your neighbor and say, I, I look forward to seeing you there. Uh, you, you absolutely cannot miss one night. Back when you were in the world, you'd be out all night, air night. So don't all of a sudden talk about how tired you are. Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. Back when you was an addict, you was a good one. When it called, you answered. So now that you are faithful to Jesus and you're a Christian, look at your neighbor and say, be a good one. All right. All right. Isaiah 66, 9. Now, I don't even know if I'm going to get past this verse. So if I don't get past the verse, if I lead it stays, that means y'all come sing something else. Isaiah 66, 9, it says this. Shall I bring you to the time of birth and not cause delivery? See? <laughs> See? I'm almost... I, I'm, I'm going to read. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm about through right there. That, touch your neighbor and say, that'll preach. You ain't even got to, if you don't understand what that says in plain English, you shouldn't need no Hebrew and Greek. Now, look, look at what he says. This is the Lord talking. Somebody said, this is God talking. Shall I bring you to the time of birth and not cause delivery, says the Lord. Shall I who cause delivery shut up the womb, says your God. Now, let me, let me read it to you. Let me read it to you. I, I like this verse that I, I don't. I'm, in fact, I don't think I've ever used this version before in the New Century Version. And I like the way it says in Isaiah 66, 9. I'm going to read it to you. It'll remain on the screens in New King James. I'll read it to you in New Century. It says, in the same way, will I not cause pain without allowing something new to be born, says the Lord. If I cause you the pain, I will not stop you from giving birth to the new thing, says your God. Uh, okay, let me translate because apparently y'all y'all apparently y'all do need translation. In, o in other words, God says, I know it hurts. I know you got some confusing situations and circumstances. But do you think I brought you to this point after you've been told and it's been prophesied that this is your year to search? Do you think I brought you to this point? To not carry this thing all the way through. I wish you look over at that neighbor and say, neighbor, he has not brought us this far for us not to surge. You ain't cried those tears. You ain't lost that money. You ain't had that tough situation just to go through it. You don't go through hell just to die. You've been through hell because God says, now it shall spring forth. Touch your neighbor and say, he didn't bring you this far for nothing. You didn't live past that accident for nothing. You didn't survive that Judas for nothing. Father, I decrease that you might increase. Speak to us now over these next few moments, that we would move and walk in everything that you have ordained. And we thank you that we are surging. <laughs> you did not cause pain what, without allowing something new to be born. You have not allowed us to get this far in this year for us to just roll over and 
die. You have not preached all of these wonderful messages to us about surging for them to just stay messages. But I declare that in this atmosphere tonight, it springs forth. I said, tonight it springs forth. If I could get some faith in the room. I said, and tonight it springs forth. In Jesus' name, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, now listen, now listen, I, I, we're going to go over something again tonight because the Lord said, son, I want you to set the stage for the conference next week. I need you to bring it back up to him. He said, because they ain't got it yet. I said, yes, sir. Touch your name and say, you need to hear this. Yeah. Uh, all right, so, so you already know the title. Tell him, say, neighbor, it's a surge, surge. 2.0. You can be seated tonight. I want to move right into this. I got 23 minutes. I got to move quick. Now, in preparation for our conference next week, which starts one week from today, tonight I'm going to re-revelate to you concerning surge. And, and I want you to understand this. Tonight, when this message speaks to you, I want you to get out of your seat. And I want you to sow something sacrificial on this altar or on your mobile device or if you're watching on the Internet campus online. Your seed creates harvest. And please understand, where you are at in your life, you are in a place to where you are right on the br a breaking point. You are right at the point of tipping over. You are right at the point of, uh, please understand, touching everything say you're closer than you've ever been uh, which is why for some of you you've had more crazy stuff happening lately than you've ever had and you're trying to figure out where in the world is this coming from I'll tell you where it's coming from you're leaning over and it's trying to push you back but you're not the type that's gonna get pushed back not this time you're the type that's gonna go all the way touch your neighbor say I go all the way we are in a surge which is a sudden and powerful forward or upward movement touch your neighbor say you're surging and tonight I want to review the four keys you need to surge this year. And I want to go back to relook at the life of a man named Jacob. Jacob, excuse me now. Most people think of Jacob as a trickster, as a player, as a two-timer. But we've learned well, throughout several messages so far this year that that narrative about Jacob isn't accurate. Just like the narrative about you to this point isn't true. Bishop, what do you mean the narrative? The story in your rap sheet up to this point, it may have said things that you did, but it did not uh, accurately articulate who you are. Please understand, sometimes when you don't know who you are, you do things that don't represent who you are. But when you come into the knowledge of who you are, you can look back and say, I did that because I didn't know who, knew who I was. But now that I know who I am, I realize that that was something I did, but it is not who I am. I'm here to tell somebody, you may have a rap sheet as long as the building, but I'm here to tell you, while you may have done everything they said you did, you are not who they say you are. Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, which means even if you made some mistakes after you became a Christian, who am I talking to? God says, I'll make you new. And when you got up this morning, I renewed you. And when you get up tomorrow, I'm renewing you. And the day after that, I'm renewing you. Touch your neighbor, say you're brand new. Now watch this, watch this now. The narrative about Jacob, it just wasn't true. His name means heel grabber or supplanter, which means to supersede and replace, not to deceive or to trick. And in Genesis 24, I'll give you the abbreviated version of the story. Rebecca marries Isaac when he was 40 after Abraham, his father, sends a servant to find a wife for Isaac. Now the Bible records that Isaac loved Rebecca, but it doesn't say that she loved Isaac back, which suggests he married her to be comforted from the death of his mother. The lesson is this, touch your neighbor and say, here's the lesson. Be careful who you run to for comfort when you're in pain. Why? Because Rebecca's name in Hebrew means a noose around the neck to stall and to get caught up in. Some of you keep getting caught up in stuff and you keep getting stuff wrapped around your neck which represents a yoke of bondage and you keep stalling out because every time you get confused or you get in pain, you run to the thing you should run from. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying tonight. Uh, touch your neighbor say, catch this tonight. Please understand, to stall means that I was making progress, but then something happened that stopped power from coming to the engine. And I'm here to tell you, you are in a part of your life that is so critical where you cannot allow anybody or anything to stop power from coming to your engine. Which means if you got people talking negative, you're going to have to say, listen, call me back when you get a... Y'all not saying nothing. Some of you, it's your family. You're going to have to say, we can't talk until this year is over because I'm surging this year and I ain't got time for your drama. I ain't got time for your negativity. I ain't got time for you telling me how it ain't going to work and how I'm not going to surge. I believe the word of the Lord and let every other man be alive. Touch your neighbor. Say, don't stall now. 
the trip about stalling is that when you stall, it means that you were already in motion. Wouldn't it be a shame for you to have come all this far in your life to only stall out now? I'm going to tell you, there is an anointing being released in this atmosphere tonight. That means a grace. That means a favor. That means a super to your natural, to where you're not stalling this time. I said, you're not stalling this time. You ain't going to come this far and get close to it and not walk in it and possess it. I decree tonight, you're not stalling. Somebody shout, I'm not stalling. Now in Genesis 25, in Genesis 25, after being barren, uh, Isaac, who was Jacob's father, pleads for Rebekah, his wife, which is also Jacob's mother, to be able to conceive. And God grants his plea. And once God grants his plea, he gives her two children. Watch this. She goes from not being able to have any children to now where she's got twins. The God we serve always does exceedingly, abundantly. And above all, you ask or think, hear me, your ceiling is his basement. And the reason God needs you to elevate your thinking and elevate your ceiling is because that's where he starts from. And if you start way down here when he wanted to do something great up here, God says, I'm not even interested in that. Ask me for something hard. I'm sick of you fasting and praying for me to pay your rent. How much you fast and pray for me to own the building? Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. I'm sick of you fasting and praying to pay your car. No, when are you going to graduate to... He gave her double for her trouble. So he gives you double for, for my trouble. Now, please understand this now. Uh, uh, she goes from not being able to have any children, and now she's got two children. But here's the trip. While she's pregnant with twins, the scripture says that she has issues during her pregnancy. So much so that she says to the Lord, Lord, if this is you, why is there a struggle? Wait a minute. She asked God for it. God, it. then she said, God, is it you? There's stuff you prayed for and it manifested and you turn it around looking at it saying, God, is this you? And the thing about it is you need to understand God is not a genie in a bottle. Well, Lord, if this is really you, then flip a switch. Now, that's what you prayed for. That's what I gave you. Now, you know it's me. What scares you is that it looks much bigger than what it was you thought it would look like. And so you're concerned whether or not you got the ability. But I wouldn't have brought it to you unless I... Just your neighbor say, you got this. Uh, so what's it? She prays for it. Then the Lord gives it to her. Then she says, Lord, if this is you, why is there a struggle? In other words, she's saying, God, I thought that if this was you, it would be easy. Which is the problem your neighbor used to have. Your neighbor used to think that anything God was in, he made it easy. Watch this. So that means the easy stuff they call God, the hard stuff they call the devil, which means they got it confused. So they've never been following God their whole life. Their whole life they've been following Satan's plan because they followed the easy plan. But tonight, you missed what I just said. How much have you forfeited and aborted because it was hard? And because it was hard, you said, well, God must not be in this. And God said, that was my fingerprint. It was proof I was in it because it was too hard for you. And in your weakness, I am made strong. And I needed it to be bigger than you because I needed you to have to lean on me and depend on me to get it done. If you can do it, what do you need me for? Are you still here? When God is in it, it does not mean there won't be a struggle. And if you can't survive the struggle, you won't see the surge. But you tonight, you are the type that doesn't only survive the, sur uh, the struggle, but you are the type that surges in the struggle. Just your neighbor say, surge in the struggle. I, I know life may not be a thing you want it to be, but you surge it in the struggle. I, I know you may have some rough nights, but you're going to surge through the struggle. I know you might have to cry yourself to sleep sometime, but you will surge through this. Just your neighbor say, surge through it. In response to Rebecca's prayer, God does not remove the struggle. That's where some of you are at tonight. You're saying, God, how come you haven't fixed this? And God said, I'm not going to. I just answered somebody's prayer, and I know it wasn't the answer you wanted. But it's the answer you need. Touch your neighbor says, it's what you needed. Lord, how are you going to fix this? God says, I'm not. Church got quiet there. Bishop, what do you mean the Lord isn't going to fix it? No, God says, I'm not removing the struggle. I'm just going to tell you it'll be worth it. God have mercy. She says, Lord, in essence, when she prays, she's saying, Lord, I want you to get rid of this. Because if this is you, why the struggle? The Lord's response is, I ain't, I ain't changed nothing. It's going to hurt all the way until you give birth. But I want to tell you, Rebecca, it's going to be worth it. Why? Because two nations are in your womb. One shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. In other words, he said to her, listen, it's going to be rough, Rebecca. What problem meal? Just neighbor said, what problem meal? Now, that's a southern way of saying, what is your boggle, dear friend? 
Now, in other words, God says, I'm not removing the pain. I'm not removing the struggle. And sometimes this is where we get confused and where we get frustrated because we're saying, God, doesn't the surge mean no struggle? And God says, mm -mm. quite the contrary. I'm not going to remove it. I'm just going to, number one, give you my grace. Come here, Sunday. My grace is sufficient for you. Touch your neighbor and say, you got grace. Grace is when God adds his super to your natural. So while other people will have broke down and lost their mind, you're looking at it saying, that ain't nothing. You crying over that? <laughs> you whining over that? <laughs> You got to be like Paul. Paul had been through so much in his life when a snake bit him. He looked at the snake and said, you must not know about me. I didn't been to hell and back. They didn't lie on me. They didn't cheat me. They didn't stomp on me. They didn't throw me down. But I'm still standing and I'm still here. And I know it's a struggle, but I'm surging anyhow. Touch your neighbor and say, surge anyhow. So he doesn't remove the struggle. He just says it's going to be worth it. Say, it's worth it. Say it again. Say, it's worth it. Uh, please understand, if you have been in the gym and you've been, and, and you've been you know, you, I mean, you're really going, going real, real, real tough, and, 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 and you were like, you had like three more reps, and your mind was like, ain't nobody going to know you cheated. <laughs> but in yourself, you were like, but I'm going to know. And when you did those three reps, it, you, it wasn't like you, you know, did all of this much stuff. You did three additional reps. And for them three additional reps, now you got your chest out to me. <laughs> it's a good workout. Woo. You ain't done nothing but an extra three reps. But the struggle was worth it because it showed you that if you're pushed, there's some more in there. I'm here to tell somebody tonight, whatever you're struggling with and struggling through, what you need to prove ain't to God, it's to yourself tonight. There's some stuff you need to prove to you. You need to prove to yourself that you don't quit all the time. You need to prove to yourself that you got what it takes to survive. You need to put, touch your name and say, prove it to yourself. All right, all right, watch this, watch this, watch this now. Now, fast forward to a day during a time of famine when, when Esau, so you know the story there. I skipped it real quickly because I'm trying to move quickly, but you know the story. While they're in the womb, the Lord says there's two nations. Say two nations. Jacob and Esau, and Jacob and Esau, while they're in the womb, they hear what God says to Rebekah about there's two nations in you. Got it? So when Jacob hears that, what does Jacob do when it's time to give birth? He lunges forward or he surges forward, which is where we get the hand movement from. He grabs Esau's heel because he heard what God said about him. In the womb, he heard what God said about him and said, I'm surging. I don't think you got that. In the womb, he was like that. And since he was like that from the womb, he was often misunderstood by people that wanted to be average. The average people looked at him and said, why he act like that? And he said, why don't you act like this? I heard what God said about me when I was in my mama's womb. Come here, Jeremiah. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Touch your, touch your neighbor and say, God's been saying good stuff about you since you were in your mother's womb. He lunges forward. He grabs Esau's heel. Say so he grabs his heel. And when he grabs his heel, he's grabbing onto what God had said about him. Now, please understand, fast forward uh, to a day during a time of famine when Esau, his brother, comes in from the field and he's weary and he makes a permanent decision from a temporary problem. And because of that, say it was a time of famine. All right, so in a time of famine when it's bad and it looks bad for everybody, sometimes you can make decisions based on the majority, but you have a report from the minority. Touch your neighbor and say, I have the minority report. But Bishop, what does that mean? It means I know the, everybody else saying this can't be done. I know everybody else saying I'm not going to surge. I know everybody else is saying it ain't going to work. That's the majority report. But every time I read in the Bible, when, when the majority said one thing, there was a Jacob or Joshua and a Caleb and a, that had a minority report. Now, the minority report says, I know you don't think this possible. You wouldn't. Because you're not a surgeon. I know you would think that my life is going to end up like yours because you would think that. But since I've been in the womb, the report about me has been that I'm a... 
know you think I'm not going to get over this situation because you ain't got over your situation from 10 years ago. You would think that. But you must not know about me because I'm a surgeon. Watch this. Watch this. Esau, is in a, he's, in a, he's in a situation. The majority report is that it's a famine in the land. And so he makes a permanent decision based on a temporary problem. He sells Jacob the right to receive the blessing which means Barak, the spoken blessing that was customarily given to the firstborn son for some soup and a biscuit. Now, he didn't value being Isaac's son, but Jacob did. That's why we refer to God as God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not of Esau, because Esau didn't value the fact that God gave him a father named Isaac. So because he didn't value, watch this, his headship, his leadership, Esau now loses this blessing, Jacob receives this blessing. Now, now touch your neighbor and say, that's powerful. Here's why it's powerful. Because as Isaac is nearing the end of his life, he tells Esau to go hunting and make him a good meal. The Bible says Esau, he knew how to cook. He was a good, he's a good cook. And uh, that he would bless him. And Rebekah overhears it and she tells Jacob to deceive Isaac so that he can receive the blessing. It was Rebekah's idea to deceive his father, not Jacob's idea to deceive his father. Jacob even tells her that he'll be cursed if he deceives Isaac. But Rebekah says the curse will be on her. So Jacob just obeyed what she said. Esau comes in after preparing the meal to receive the blessing, but Isaac says, it's too late. He says, I've already blessed your brother, but I have an issue with the fact that Esau even went in expecting to receive the blessing because evidently he forgot that he had sold it and it was now Jacob's. I'm going to tell somebody, don't be angry when you lose what you didn't value and God gives it to another that values it. So watch this, watch this. Because, watch this, I'm, 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 I'm help you understand some stuff, even in your family, your bloodline. Esau ends up hating his brother because his brother gets what he acted like he didn't want. Esau ends up hating his brother because Jacob saw the value of being the son, but Esau did not. He hates him so much, now they've got family strife, they got family schism, and he wants to kill his brother. So Rebecca tells him to go flee to Uncle Laban to be safe. Y'all still with me? He asks Laban for his daughter. When Jacob gets there, he, he looks, and the Bible says he sees Rachel. And he asks Laban for his daughter, Rachel. But look at what Laban asked him in Gen Genesis 29 and 15. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now, watch this. Laban says, you want Rachel, which is your promise. Say promise. promise. All right. He says, watch this. Tell me what your wages should be. You, you missed it. He didn't set the terms, Jacob did. All right? You've heard me say this several times, but I need you to catch this tonight. Why didn't Jacob say seven days? Why didn't he say seven minutes? Okay? Why do you keep saying in five years? Why do you keep saying one day? You've been setting bad terms through your bad confessions and declarations, and what you've been saying has been used against you. But tonight, touch your name and say, but tonight. I'm going to tell you, if you've been in lack, it's because you set those terms. If your life is jacked up, stop being mad at God. You set those terms. But the good news is, if you set the terms, I can also reset the terms. I wish you'd look at your neighbor and say, you're going to reset the terms tonight. Stop saying nothing works for me. Instead, say, I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. I am more than a conqueror. Everything is working together for my good. Even my bad is working for my good. Just your neighbor say, reset the terms. Please understand. Please understand. If you don't surge, it will not be, don't go, but Bishop prophesied and it didn't happen. No, 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 no. There ain't no problem with the seed. It's a problem with the womb. Are you hearing what I'm saying tonight? Now, now, touch your name and say, reset the terms. All right, all right. So what have you been saying that's been setting bad terms? Just seems like, stop talking after that point. Just be quiet. Hush. Somebody calling your name. You know who's calling your name? Sense. Not C-E-N-T-S. S-E-N-S-E. -E. Well, Bishop, but, see, stop. That's been your problem? Your whole life, your butt. <laughs> say amen to that. Amen. All right, I'll move on. Now, watch this. Say, say reset the terms. 
He sets the term for seven years, not Laban. Check this out. It's kind of interesting. He gets mad at Laban for deceiving him, but he sets bad terms up front. How many folk are you mad at God tonight because, you know, you got, you got, you know, you're like, I'm praising him, but I'm going to leave my half praise. Cause I'm kinda. And, and you cause him anger with him, but you set bad terms. You're the one that, please understand, whatever you were speaking last year and last month, that's what you're looking at. Whatever you were fearing that you allowed to stay in your mind. That's why Job said the thing that I feared the most. It's quiet in this church. Touch your name and say, I'm resetting the terms tonight. I got to move. Jacob gets Leah. After seven years, Laban tricks him, and he gives uh, Jacob Leah, whose name in Hebrew means weary and tired, which means after seven years of labor, uh, Jacob ends up getting weary and tired. And Laban deceives Jacob just like his mother had him to deceive Isaac. But the scripture says that he says, I'll work another seven years for him. Ain't that something? Now, uh, what I says, uh, the first key I gave you to surge this year is that you want to you need to be committed. Say committed, committed. and dedicated. Yeah. Uh, please understand, you're not going to succeed in anything if you're committed to non-commitment. Many people are committed to not being committed to anything. That's their commitment. They won't sign up for Netflix, so that's too much of a commitment. And I'm not endorsing Netflix or unendorsing Netflix. I'm just saying it requires a monthly subscription. Some people won't serve because it's a commitment. Now, you're already here all the time anyhow. You're here Sunday for both of them. You're here Wednesday. But I don't know if I can serve the commitment. Well, what's the extra commitment? The issue is, is you are committed to non-commitment, which is why you've been committed to complacency. It's quiet in here. Uh, when we determine what we are committed to, it's a predecision of what we're not committed to. So this year, somebody say this year. Your commitment to Jesus, which means your commitment to church and serving in church must be like Jacob's for Rachel. Jacob said, well, I ain't leaving until I got her. In other words, he was right or die. And let me translate for you. That means he was committed. Somebody say he was committed. You have been sent to harvest to change the world with me. And at harvest, we are a ride or die people. At harvest, we are a committed people. At Just the name say, we are a committed people here. Uh, all right. Jacob didn't know this, though, that Laban's name meant to purify. Now, uh, if, if, if we were in a Bible college session, I'd take into the depth of what his name means because his name actually has much more, uh, uh, a much more significant meaning that explains what's going on in our nation today across the country. But, but this isn't Bible college, so I can't do that. But his name means to purify. Say purify. purify. Now, hear me. There's some stuff that seem to wear you out, seem to make you weary, seem to make you tired. But it was purifying you. It looked bad, but it was really tough. Why, Bishop? It killed your pride. It killed your rebellion. It killed your disobedience, and it showed you the real deal about you. And then the Bible says at the end of seven years, which means that it was in the 15th year that he finally received what he'd been laboring for. I need to throw that back at you again. I need to throw that back at you again. If Jacob's a surger and the 15th year got him what he had labored for and you a surger, I'm, see y'all don't know when to shout here. I'm telling you that Laban owes you some stuff that you labored for years ago. And in this 15th year, just your neighbor say, Laban's about to pay me. And he's trying to act like he ain't going to pay. That's what's been going on in your life. He acting like he holding out like he ain't going to give it to you. But it's too late because God has already decreed. Somebody holler, Laban, pay me what you owe me. Watch this now. For six more years, I got to move. I'm almost out of time. For six more years. Jacob remains with Laban, and he prospers. And when he departs, Rachel steals some of the idols that Laban worships. And Jacob doesn't know about it, but Laban wants to hurt him. But the Lord says to Laban, wait a minute, you're not going to mess with Jacob. And in fact, in Genesis 31, 42, Laban chases after Jacob, and he chases after Rachel uh, because he wants to get his idols back. Uh, but Jacob didn't know that uh, Rachel had taken the idols, and so he's chasing after him. And in his mind, he says, I'm going to get Jacob. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to hurt him because he left. I didn't know what he was doing. But what I love about Genesis 31, 42 is that uh, Jacob uh, or uh, Laban has this experience with God. It says this. 
Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction. Watch this. And he's seen the labor of my hands. And last night he rebuked you. Now, look what he says. He says he's seen the labor of my hands. What's he implying? He's saying I've been consistent even though I've been in pain. I've been consistent even though I've been confused. I've been consistent even though I've been in some tight spots. I've been consistent even when I didn't know what God was doing. I was consistent when I couldn't trace him. I was consistent. Touch your neighbor and say, got to say consistent. Which took us to the second key, which was consistency. He said, to, he says, Jacob says to Laban, he says, because I've been consistent, the Lord rebuked you last night and told you not to mess with me. I need to tell some of y'all something. This, this is why you don't play with church attendance, and this is why you don't play with serving, because let me tell you what it does for you, is it goes and fights for you when you're asleep. For some of y'all, the only reason your life ain't fell apart is because you had on that welcome team shirt, and the Lord went to somebody that was coming to try to take you out, and he said, oh no, you ain't messing with them. They're consistent and they're faithful. And he rebuked them because of your faithful servant. He rebuked them because of your faithful church attendance. I'm here to tell you, it fights for you when you're asleep. Watch this. <laughs> that's, why, that's why if you're faithful and consistent in those things, don't you ever worry about an enemy. What you do is say, oh, no, I'm going to serve this enemy into rebuke. <laughs> what you over there doing? The Lord's getting ready to rebuke my enemy. Put up the verse, Genesis 31, 42. Put it up. <laughs> what, what you doing? The Lord's getting ready to puke my enemy. While you moving the mic, stand and cook. What you doing? The Lord's getting ready to puke my enemy. Y'all ain't saying that to me. While you up here doing praise and worship, what, what you doing? The Lord is rebuking my enemy. While them suckers are asleep, God is saying, you better not mess with them. You better not touch them. You better not start nothing for them. I knocked them. That's why when you go through tight spots, the desire is to become inconsistent. Because Satan knows if you become inconsistent, that God can't rebuke your enemy. He has no ground to stand on. So this week I've talked to several pastors who were so discouraged. And one pastor was like, this, I'm, I'm sick of them. I said, well, I understand. <laughs> This and this, this and this and this. And then I said, but wait a minute. I said, something's in the atmosphere. I said, we got, we got, we got, we got to capture this. I said, because see, because see, there's something that, that, that's on the other side of you pressing through your frustration with them. Look at verse 42. He says, and God's seen my affliction and he's seen the labor of my hands, my consistent labor. He did it for over 20 years. And he rebuked you last night. And the Lord told Laban, you better not touch him. Let me tell you, King James cleaned it up. Let me tell you what God really said. I'll kill you if you hurt him. Bishop, I thought he was love. He does. He loves his children. Everybody's his creation, but not everybody's his child. Mess with him. I'll take everything. Say something about it. Say something about it. Fix your mouth to say something about him. I'll kill you. That's your Bible. Y'all still here? Yeah. Say consistency. Uh, the second key I gave you, I'm almost through, was to keep doing the right things even after they work. Somebody say, keep doing the right things even after they work. So check this out. Wouldn't it have been good for, uh, or, 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 or reasonable for Jacob to become inconsistent after seven years? Wouldn't that be reasonable? I mean, after all, he got tricked, right? You get tricked, you're going to be inconsistent, right? Used to be. Uh-uh. I'm going to tell you this time, if you get your feelings hurt, be even more consistent. Why? Why? Because even after seven years, Jacob was still consistent. Then another seven years, he's still consistent. Then six years after that, he's still consistent. And his consistency made God rebuke his enemy. Which means your consistency is going to make God rebuke your sickness. Your consistency is going to make God rebuke your financial lack. 
You're not hearing what I'm saying. Your consistency is going to make all them haters. Stop worrying about them. You better go to sleep. Stop the, what they say about me today. Forget what they said about you today. If you'll stay consistent, God going to get them up in the middle of the night and say, I heard what you said about my daughter. I heard what you said about my son. And if you miss with them, I promise you. I swear for God. He swears by himself, the Bible says. Now, even after they work, keep being consistent. Many people stop doing consistent and stop being consistent after it works. You know it works, you watch it work, then you're like, I'm going to go try this though. But you just watch this work. So why did you stop doing what worked? Tell your neighbors, they don't stop doing what works. I, I got to finish. As Jacob goes on his way, he sends messengers uh, to Esau to make sure everything's cool as he passes by and make sure everything's okay. So after this encounter with Laban, he keeps on going and he finds out that his brother Esau is coming to get him. And the messengers come to him and say, Esau's coming and he's coming with 400 men. So what did Jacob think? Because remember, Esau wanted to what? Kill him. So what does he think about Esau having 400 men? That those 400 men were there to kill him. He's beat Laban. Laban's paid him what he owed him, and now he's got a situation where it looks like somebody wants to take him out from a grudge from years ago. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Jacob gets stressed out. Wouldn't you get stressed out, though? I mean, the old you. I know the new you is spiritual. But the old you, wouldn't the old you get stressed out, though? Like, oh, my God. How many men? 400. Now, how do you count that? Like, did you estimate where you get the 400 from? He says, 400 men are coming with Esau, and Esau looked like he ready to throw down. It's getting ready to be some smoke in the city. Somebody's head's getting ready to get beat to the white meat. It's getting ready to be something in here because he's sure he's going to kill him. And the Bible says he cries out to God, then something powerful happens, which took us to the third key I gave you, which was to command every day. All right? I taught this revelation to you uh, some time ago, and I need you to get the CDs of the message, Command Your Year, but I want to revisit it briefly. In Genesis 31, 24, the Bible says, then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him. Now, man there is angel, and angel in this specific text is dealing with Jesus before he had a body where we called him Jesus. So he's wrestling with God, uh, says, and the inference is that he prayed in a forceful manner, mm. familiar, the effective and fervent. Fervent means passionate. And he wrestled with a man until the breaking of day. Which means, watch this, when, when did Jacob pray? Huh? The night before. How do I know? Because he wrestled with him, which infers that he prayed with him in a fervent or passionate manner. That he wrestled with him until the day broke. Which means, watch this, Jacob was commanding the day before the day got here because he got word that a problem was on its way. Watch this. But before the problem showed up, he started talking to God about the promise. Before the problem showed up, he said, no, 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 no. I've been through too much. I've gone through too much. And I know Esau got a problem with me, but I'm not going down like this. So he commands his day before the sun rises. Now watch this. Verse 25. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. Look at this verse. This is powerful. Now when he, what is he? Capitalize. Now if you don't shout off this, I don't know what's going to make you shout. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him. Okay. All right. Let me try this section over here. Now, when God saw that God didn't win against Jacob, which means there's a level of prayer you can get to, to where God says, I was going to do this. But after you prayed like that on Wednesday night live at Harvest, I just changed my mind. Touch your neighbor and say, command your day. I'm here to tell you, you can pray in such a way to where God himself changes his mind. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Verse 25. I need you to get this. Now when he saw, who's he? God, when God saw that no matter what came against Jacob, Jacob wouldn't stop. Ah! Now when God saw 
that after everything that's come against you, that you would not stop and that you kept praying and that you kept giving and that you kept fasting when God saw that God changed his mind. I don't know about you tonight, but I want to go back for just a little bit. Touch your neighbor and say, change the Lord's mind tonight. Change. I'm going to make God change his mind tonight. Watch. Now when he saw he didn't prevail against him, I'm out of time. He touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint and he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go because the sun getting ready to come. But he said, I'm not letting you go. Where the I'm not letting go people at? I thought I was talking to surgeons. I didn't know I was talking to average. I thought y'all were surgeons. I thought y'all were Jacobs. I thought y'all were. Somebody holler, I am. He said, I'm not letting go. In pain, but I ain't letting go. Tired, but I ain't letting go. Frustrated, but I ain't letting go. I might be limping, but I ain't letting go. Tell your neighbor, so you better not let go. I'm not letting you go until you tell me who I am. Because remember, the blessing he originally had was technically Esau's. So he said, since the story about it is that I took it, I'm going to need a fresh one. I'm not letting you go. Touch it I'm not letting go. No, you need to talk to him. T tell him like you're real serious about saying, I ain't letting go. Well, Bishop the doctor, I ain't letting go. Well, Bishop the credit report said, I ain't letting go. Well, they coming to get the car. I ain't letting go. I got to finish. Should I finish? When did he pray, y'all? For the sun came up. With God, you have told you this, the day starts the evening prior, which means Thursday's being set right now. And if you wait for Thursday to get here, Genesis 1 teaches us that the day will have already set itself. Now, put peace on stand. I want to give you the practical thing you listen, and then I got to finish. Now I'm way over time. Put peace on stand. Say, command my day. If you don't have a targeted prayer list, listen to me. Follow my instructions or just be average, okay? All, right, all this negotiating, I don't do that. Because they say, follow instructions. You need to go to KLU. Then you need to learn how to make a targeted prayer list. Then you need to make a targeted prayer list. Then you need to pray the targeted prayer list. And you need to pray it the night before the next day. Now when you're laying in your bed telling my Lord Jesus, no. You got to be like Jacob. Jacob was like, uh-uh. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, I got something for Thursday. Wednesday threw a curveball at me. Wednesday threw a little something. I wasn't, what, what? I wasn't ready for that on Wednesday. Woo, but I got something for Thursday. Nah. He said, he said, he said, he said, I'm going to pray in such a way to where God says he won't stop. He just won't stop. Some will get what he asked for. So watch this. So, so practically, pray your targeted prayer list. Then here's what you do. You bless every appointment. You bless every meeting. You bless the day. You ask God to order your steps in the day. See, you know why you don't have to live in regret? Because if you command your day and say, Father, I declare that every step I take is ordered by you, then that means everything I did in that day if I stayed in him and I didn't get off into your flesh and all this and feelings and stuff, then I can, I, no, I don't have no regret because I gave him the day. Which means everything I did in the day, he ordained for me to do in the day. So I have no regret. That's how you live regret free. Now, watch what, this, watch this. Because Jacob commanded his day when Esau came. Now, remember Esau swore that he would kill him. Esau doesn't come to kill him. The Bible says Esau came to bless him. When you command your day, what you're afraid of isn't coming to kill you. It's coming to help you. 
You not hear me? Which means the creditor, I'll just use this for an example. The creditor, you may have not been answering the phone because you thought they were going to call you with some bad news. You're like, well, I'm just going to avoid it. When you command your day, they're going to say, man, we've been trying to reach you. Sir, we've been trying to reach you. We got a special program we just started yesterday. And you, we want you to be the first one in the program. So these four payments, you ain't got to pay them because we're trying this whole new program. You're not hearing me. You're not hearing me. When you command your day, what was coming originally with, to come against you, all of a sudden God will he'll turn that thing and it'll come to work for you. Are you here? I said, are you here? Which brings us to the fourth key, and I'm through. What was the first key? What was the first key? What's the second key? Consistent. Keep doing the right things even after they work. Third key? See, don't, don't you go to sleep one night not having told the next day what to do. You've got to get a hold of the day before the day gets a hold of you. That's why some of you, your day is like, it started real good, then it just, it just went crazy. You did that. Because you let it do that the night before. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, watch this. I'm through. I'm through. This fourth key. This fourth key. Compose a new story. Remember, Jacob's story was that he was a deceiver, a liar, heartbreaker. All that. But in, in, in Genesis 32, he asked God to rewrite his story. You've used your past as an excuse for too long. You've used how people have hurt you as an excuse for too long. You've used what they did to you as an excuse for too long. You've justified your rebellion for too long. You, yep. You've justified your failure for too long. You've justified your average for too long. Well, Bishop, because I've been through... Listen, ain't nothing unique about your story. You're unique, but your story is not. You ain't the only somebody whose mama didn't do this. You ain't the only somebody whose daddy didn't do this. You ain't the only somebody that, that had somebody walk out on you. You ain't the only somebody that gave somebody $100 and then they didn't want to be your friend no more. You ought to be thankful. You ought to say, thank you, Jesus. You only gave 100 Some of us gave hundreds of thousands. It's quiet in here. Not the only one who had somebody walk out on you. Not the, you know, touch on him and say, your story's not unique. All right, so then you can, you can take that off. But Bishop, I was there for my kids. You're supposed to be. If you play, you got to pay. So in honor of Mother's Day week, <laughs> mamas, you're supposed to take care of them. Dad is, I take care of my kids. That ain't nothing to brag about. You're supposed to. Wearing it like it's a badge. That's what you signed up for. I'm saying something. Somebody say something. <laughs> I'm saying something. Now, Mr. what are you trying to say? Jacob could have used that as his excuse. And something happened to him on this day when he was commanding his day. And he said, I want my story to be rewritten. Because up until this point, my story has been rough. It's been tough. It's been a lifetime movie. And I'm sick of that. You ought to be sick of that. Matter of fact, let me prove it to you. There are certain times where you get real frustrated with you, where you get so mad with you. Some, sometimes you get, I, I'm talking to somebody, because you get so mad with you, you get in tears about you. And the men included. You just get so mad at you. You're like, what are you doing? 
Jacob got to this point. Watch this. And in Genesis 32, 26, I'm through. He said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. He said to him, watch the change. He said, what's your name, yo? That is a southern phraseology for what is your name? He said, superseder, heel grabber, supplanter. And he said, I'll tell you what. First place we got to start with rewriting your story, composing a new story, is we got to change your name. He said, that ain't your name anymore. He said, because they keep getting confused about that. They think that means you're a trickster. He says, I'm going to change your name. He says, no, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Watch this. He said, because your whole life you've been struggling with me and you've been struggling with men. Now let me make this personal for some woman in the place. You've been struggling between God and you've been struggling with your inability to put good men. All right? Let me generalize it for everybody. You've been struggling with God and you've been struggling with people. You've been struggling with God and you've been struggling with why your daddy didn't want you. You've been struggling with God and you've been struggling with this. And you've been struggling with God and you've been struggling with this. And he says, but watch what you want. You've been struggling with acceptance and you've been struggling with God, but you won. You've been struggling with identity and you've been struggling with God, but you won. High five three people tell them, but you won. <laughs> then Jacob asked saying, now that you told me who I am, tell me who you are. It's amazing how, how there's a boldness that comes on you when you know that you know that you know who you are. See, that's why some people call you stuck up. You're not stuck up. You're just aware. And because they're unaware, they don't know what aware looks like. No, you're just mad because I don't want to be part of your average thing. But chickens hang out together. Eagles can fly by. So you can call me arrogant. You can call me. So you call me. I done been called worse. Call me whatever you got to call me. But I don't answer to what you call me. I answer to what God. Call. <laughs> so he says, what's your name? He says, why you want to know my name? And I love the Bible because the Bible doesn't answer what happened. The Bible just says, and the Lord blessed him there. What if the story you've been telling about yourself and believing about yourself is wrong? What if you're not a loser? What if you're not a failure? What if you're not a negative statistic? What if you were already healed? You're the only one who don't know it. What if your kids would serve Jesus if you'd stop saying they won't? I'm over time. What's the first key? Second key. Do the right things even after they work. Third key. Command every day. We're going to do that in just a moment. What's the fourth key? Compose a new story. Bishop, how do I do that practically? Change what you see. In, in, in every environment I'm in, um, I set it. And not just by presence, but I set it by what's in it. Got it? Everything that's in there is strategic. I have a lot of lions. So that if ever I feel like backing down and punking out and being average, I look and say, that ain't who I am. I have a lot of eagles to remind me that eagles fly. I have a lot of globes because I'm reminding myself that we thank God for one city, uh, but I wasn't sent just for one city. For this reason was I sent. And that ain't to just change a city or a region. That is because 
I believe what he sent me here to do is to change the globe. I have things up that remind me about excellence. It's a lifestyle. Things that remind me. You can start a new story by changing your environment. What's around you? What do you look at every day? Some of you are pack rats. And the reason you always feel stuck in the past is because that's all you look at. You got hundreds of boxes of past. Talking about, well, one day. If you ain't looked in that box in the last year, you probably ain't gonna look in that box. But I, I'm just holding on to it for what? Are you hearing me tonight? Tonight, if you're in this worship against, I'm done. I'm over time, but did you get something tonight? <laughs> Touch your neighbor and say, Surge 2.0. Now, I'm setting the stage because, listen, next week the conference starts. And I'm just telling you. I am so excited. I'm in anticipation of what God's going to do. He's going to meet us in a special and a supernatural way. Somebody say, I believe that. So be here. Uh, but I wanted to set the stage tonight so that this atmosphere was conducive for surge. Supernatural testimonies and miracles are going to manifest. And this atmosphere needed to be set tonight. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now tonight, if you're in this worship experience and if you never give your life to Jesus, i got great news. There is forgiveness for you. 2,000 years ago, God stepped in a body. The name of that body was Jesus. That body paid the price for every sin we would ever commit. Sins are things that we do that don't please God. They don't please God because they hurt us. He died for those sins so that we could have life. That's eternal life and life more abundantly. That is now to where on earth we live so good that we bring heaven down here. Say abundant life. Say no more struggling with what I shouldn't struggle with. I'm stressed. Stop being stressed. Well, I just don't. Hush. You need to become a Christian for the first time. There's forgiveness for you. Secondly, if you give your life to Jesus, but you've not been faithful in serving him, I've got good news for you. There is forgiveness for you. And I want to challenge you tonight. I said something, I think, last Wednesday uh, about becoming a professional Christian. Don't get so good at being a Christian and always needing grace and mercy that you don't even make an attempt to get better, that you don't even make an attempt to change. So tonight, if either one of those you need to become a Christian, recommit yourself to Jesus, wherever you're at. On the count of three, I want you to throw your hand up. And when you do, we're going to shout and celebrate for you. Because at the end of the day, that's important to God and it's important to us. You need to become a Christian for the first time or recommit yourself to Jesus. Bishop Foreman, I have questions. What about this? What about that? He's got answers. Listen, you don't wait to get in the elevator until you check it out. You just trust that it's been inspected and it's good. It's the same thing with God. You don't have to know everything about how every little thing works before you get on the elevator and ride up. There's another word for that. It's <laughs> surge. <laughs> well, how does... Get on the elevator. So tonight, if you need to become a Christian or get back in the elevator, do it tonight. On the count of three, throw your hands up. Every eye open, every head up. Because Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. Father, one of those of you on the count of three, throw your hand up. Whether you're here in the world campus or watching online. One, two, three. If that's you, throw your hand up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, come on, Harvest. Give God praise for every hand. Hallelujah. For every hand we can't see, give him praise for it. So many watch online. Hallelujah. Now, now every hand lifted in this place. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for dying in my place. Because of that belief. Because of that confession, if this is my first time praying this, I am a Christian. If I was far from you, I'm reconnected to you. Great days are ahead of me. I'm surging. This atmosphere is set. My life is set. The stage is set for the conference next week. I have great expectations in Jesus' name. Give God praise tonight, everybody. Oh, I said give God praise tonight. Hallelujah. Listen, if you just made a decision to become a Christian or recommit yourself to Jesus, take out your mobile phone and text the word decision to the phone number 59769. And when you do that, we're going to send you a text message right away. It's going to give you some tools to help you serve Jesus faithfully. As you take your seats or if you're already seated, just encourage five people. Five, now, not six and not three and not four. 
How many? Five. Encourage five people tonight with a hug or a handshake and just tell them, I see, I'll see you in your surge. I'll see you in your surge. Five of them, five of them, five of them, five of them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Even if you're watching online, just chat it in to somebody. If they don't chat you back, then just tweet it to us at Bishop Foreman. Hallelujah. We're getting ready to give in just a moment, but did you get something tonight? Did you learn tonight? Did you grow tonight? Hallelujah. Tonight's message is available, Surge 2.0, in the bookstore and cafe, right? Uh, right after the worship experience, I wanted to make sure, again, the Lord said, reset the atmosphere. Go back over that again. I, I can't do it Sunday. Sunday, we're moving somewhere else um, in our series. But uh, I needed to do that tonight so that the stage was set uh, for next week. Do not miss the conference. In fact, I want you to watch this video for our 2015 Harvest Conference. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Awesome. So make sure you're here. Listen, you can still get registered for the day sessions. Uh, it's still just $30. Our out-of-state guest asked us to extend uh, the early registration, so we've done that for everyone uh, since we did it for them. And so make sure you avail yourself to that. Be here for the day, especially, you know, if you ain't doing nothing during the day. Because those are not streamed during the day, so make sure that you're here during the day. And, of course, be here for the evening sessions. All the details available on harvestcc.me. Join us this Saturday. Don't forget, we're going to be out in the community Saturday at 10 a.m. We're going to be in the community giving out some invites to our church. And here's the deal. You may say, Bishop, I, get, I invite people and they never come. Well, here, well here's what you need because I've heard people tell me that. Here's what you need to know. They might be watching online. Oftentimes, especially on like a Wednesday, they're more looking at us through that camera than sometimes even hear what's in the auditorium. And, and oftentimes what's here in the auditorium. So you may not know. They might be watching. And so many, so also when I hear the stories of people, people say, Bishop, I was watching for seven months. I was watching for 12. I'm like, what are you doing watching for seven months? Why didn't you come? You live across the street. Why didn't you come in the building? But because of technology, we're able to reach people through our app. Something like almost 1,600 people have our app now. It's like 1590 or something like that. 1594 or 44, something like that. So, uh, so they might be watching. So never, never think that uh, when you invite people to church that it's, it's in vain because it's not. Uh, because when that person gives their life to Jesus, it's added to your account. And when you stand in front of the Lord, the Lord's going to say, all right, you, all these people. You know about the Lord? Who are those people? Those are the people you gave an invite to, but you didn't know their name. You didn't know who they were. But they're saved because of you. And so be here with us Saturday at 10 a.m. Anybody can come and be a part of that. And uh, we'll move and walk in what God has ordained. If you want to get involved at Harvest, your first step is KLU. You heard mentioning the teaching. All those details are available in your communique. And uh, let's see here. Students, y'all give our students a great hand. We appreciate our students. I love our students. Amen. Hallelujah. Y'all make your back straight. Don't be all hunched over. Broke people are hunched over. Put your back like this here. So you, there you go. There you go. And students, look at the student next to you and say, that's how surgers sit. Tell them that's how I'm and we sitting all like this here. Put your, make your back straight. You see what I'm saying? And pop your neck. You understand? That's how bosses do stuff. See what I'm saying? Amen. Listen, real quickly, um, uh, as we get ready to give, we're going to give now in just a few moments, um, and we're going to sow tonight. And uh, thank you for your faithful giving. It's changing lives, and it is blessing you. Don't forget, in your giving, make sure you always give tithes and offerings, offer any tax refunds. If you want to give on a mobile device, all the information is coming up now at the bottom of the screen for you to text that in. Also, two more things.